Hello and welcome to episode three of my How to Make a Platformer in Bevy series. In this episode, I'll be covering how I added the ghost characters that I mentioned in my previous episode into my game. In the last episode, I covered how to use plugins. So in this episode, I'm gonna focus more on the design decisions and approaches that I take when making new systems for my game. This should hopefully expand people's ability to problem solve and create these systems on their own by showing how you can quickly make a system that works and then later on refine other systems around it to get the functionality that you want. I'd also like to thank everyone for how much they're enjoying and commenting on this series. It really helps motivate me. At the end of the last episode, I talked about how I wanted to add ghosts that follow the player around. And if you collide with them, they'll kill you. And this was going to be the core gimmick of the game. To achieve this, I first started off by creating a few resources and components that I figured I would need in order to be able to implement this functionality. The first of these was the component ghost. This would be used to mark which of the entities were ghosts and therefore needed to follow the player's path. To keep track of how far along the ghost is on the player's path, the ghost component also stores a U size, which represents the frame that the ghost is currently on compared to the player. Since I'm keeping track of the ghost's using their frames relative to the player, I also needed to keep track of the player frame. For this, I use a resource since all the ghosts and the players will need to be able to look up what the current frame of the game is. I could use Bevy's built-in systems for tracking how long since the game started, but this would mean you wouldn't be able to reset the ghosts or their trails once the game has started without restarting the game itself. Instead, tracking this with a resource also allows for other things such as pausing the game without things like the ghosts continuing to travel because the frame time of the actual game continues to rise. I also needed a component to keep track of which of the entities was the actual player to keep track of. This could have been done with the without ghost filter, but I decided to include a real player flag. I need to use a separate component from my player component since in the previous episode, I adapted that to keep track of what form the player was in. And since the ghosts will also be able to change form, they also need to be able to track what form they are in. To keep track of how the ghosts need to move after the player, I also have a resource called player inputs. This is simply a hash map of the frame and the inputs that the player was pressing at the time. I then add some very simple functionality, such as a frame updater, which increments the player frame and all ghost frames by one each frame. A save player input system, which at the end of each frame will grab the current player's input state and save that into the resource. And finally, the update ghost system takes in all the ghosts, uses their current frame and updates their input state so that the ghosts can now mimic the player's movement with their fixed offsets. Finally, inside a plugin, I needed to make sure that all my resources were initialized and I need to make sure my systems run in the correct stage. Since I need to make sure all the player's inputs have been collected before I save them, I need to make sure the frame is updated before all my movement systems run. Since this could result in ghosts missing a frame, since if the frame update ran before the movement system one frame and after another, they would repeat the same frame twice and then miss the next frame depending on the orientation of the frames incrementation. You'll also see that I'm using a system label for the update ghost system to have it happen before the player moves systems. The update ghost system needs to run in the update stage, since if it runs in the first or pre-update stage, Leafwing Studio's input manager will actually run its systems on top of the inputs, which will change all just pressed into pressed, since it's assuming that the previous frame was when they were just pressed. This will result in the ghosts not following the player exactly. So I need to make sure that the ghosts inputs are updated in the same stage as the system that moves them. Otherwise, the, they will not act exactly the same as the player did. I also add a system that lets me spawn in test ghosts that will follow me around. As you can see, I can run around the screen just as normal, jumping on platforms and moving around. When I hit the escape key, a ghost will spawn and follow my movements almost exactly. But if I do any particularly complicated movements and say jump up onto a block and around a corner, this can result in the ghost not making exactly the same frame perfect jumps and getting caught and falling behind. I refer to this as frame drift, and it occurs when any substantial length of time passes where any seemingly frame perfect input was required. 
but also on longer time frames can occur just simply by the fact that the physics engine is not deterministic and has a slight bit of randomness from floating point calculations. To fix the player drift and now make sure that our ghosts don't fall out of sync, what we do is we create a new resource called the sync offset which takes in a frame and a vec3. This is the offset of the player on that frame. Then we create a system that saves the offset, very similar to how we save the player's inputs. And similar to how we replay the player's inputs, we add a drift correction system that on every sync frame, which is simply the frame modulo by the distance between sync frames, we reset all ghost positions equal to what the player's position was on that frame. This means that depending on what our sync frame timing is, the ghost cannot fall further than that behind the player. And this is all that's really required to set the ghost back in line with the player. As you can see, with this new code added, the ghost will now be able to follow us even through the complex jumps to get into the top platform. The issue that you'll notice is that the ghost can end up having a jitter to it. This is because the ghost falls behind on their physics update, but the sync frame simply pulls them back into the correct position. But their velocity is still incorrect, so every sync frame, they need to be reset in position until they land on the ground. This can cause horrible jitter. I fix this later with changing how I track the player. This is primarily happening because my user input is one frame out from my sync frames, which means that the player ends up being one frame behind where they were, or one frame in front of where the user inputs actually happen, resulting in the character needing to be reset every single sync frame. Before we move on to fixing the jitter, let's first make sure that the ghosts don't collide with each other. You'll notice in this clip that even though I did some flips and made it to a position, if I run two ghosts at the same time, the ghosts will not get to the same position that I did because they managed to collide with each other. You would think that this wouldn't be possible since me, the player, did not collide with the ghosts. But this actually occurs because the ghosts are offset, which means I can pass through a path and then my ghost can follow through that path but when the third ghost goes to go through the path, the second ghost may have actually crossed back. And since the third ghost didn't exist when I was the player jumping back through, means that the second ghost actually collides with it. This is where using a pre-built plugin for our physics is really helpful, since, since Bevy Rapier has what it calls collision groups. There is also a, a matching group for this, I believe called intersection groups, which works for triggers as opposed to collider on collider collisions. The way the collision groups work is two colliders can only interact if they are belonging to the group that the other collider can hit and the other collider belongs to a group that they can hit. Only if both these conditions are true does the physics engine run narrow band collisions on the two objects. The Bevy Rapier plugin allows us to add collision groups as a component. So on the ghosts all we do is include a new collision group where the first parameter passed to the new function is the group that this collider belongs to. And the second parameter in the method is the groups that this can collide with. We put the ghost in group two and say that they collide with group one. The primary reason why we have to have them collide with group one is if they collide with none, they won't collide with the ground and simply will not work at all. And we put them in group two since there is no overlap between group one and group two. Ghosts cannot hit each other, but they can hit the player and any ground or obstacles. We will also make sure that if we add enemies into the game that the player can collide with, they cannot collide with the ghost. Similar, any moving platforms will not be able to collide with the ghost, since they will be very hard to sync up the ghost movement so that they land on the platform. Instead, the ghosts will simply levitate through the platform and end up where they're supposed to go, since they have a predefined path. Under the hood, Bevy Rapier groups are just U32s with certain bits set. This means that you can logic OR and AND groups together in order to create objects that can collide with multiple groups or belong to multiple groups for collision. By default, Bevy Rapier will consider an entity to be part of the ALL collision group if no collision group component is provided. This means that our player and ground will collide with absolutely everything since they get a U32 max as their group that they are in and a U32 max as the group they can collide with. 
This means that if you're not actually using the collision group functionality, all colliders will collide with all other colliders, unless otherwise specified. As you can see in this clip, the ghosts are completely capable of phasing through each other. If, the, however, the player does collide with the ghost, it makes the jitter incredibly bad. This is again just simply because once the physics engine ends up one frame out of sync with the sync frames, the ghosts will never get back into sync. But the key point to take away is that the ghosts can move through each other, which makes their positioning much more stable since the ghosts will con since in theory, all ghosts will end up standing in the same place when they're done moving, or if the player is standing still long enough that the ghosts catch up to each other, we don't want the ghosts colliding since they will push each other around. The way I came up with removing the jitter was to store the player's state as opposed to their direct inputs. Since in the previous video I also updated all of the animation systems to use the player's state, such as velocity, can double jump, and what player they are, to display the correct animation, we automatically get all the animations for free without needing to track that directly for the ghosts. I also swapped from using a hash map to using a vector. The main reason for this is just memory reduction, since if you leave the game running for an extended period of time without any ghosts moving, the game will still track the player's position and continue to increase the size. So my idea was shrink the footprint and increase the speed as much as possible so that accessing the memory would not be a problem. The way that we access the correct piece of data for a frame is indexing into the vector to that frame's index. This then contains the data that we need for that specific frame. The same change was made to the sync frame resource, except in that case, we divide the current frame by the sync time and use that as the index into the map. We also modulo the frame by the sync time equal to one, so that we only push onto the vector on the appropriate frames. We then modify our update ghost system to take in their velocity, their jump, and their player state, and then do exactly the same logic, setting all of those appropriately. As you can see now in this clip, the jitter is entirely gone. This is because the user's input is now completely decoupled from the values that we store, and the sync frame and velocities are now completely synced up. This does mean that we are doing redundant calculations using the physics engine on the ghosts, since we are just taking the player's calculated physics and applying that every frame. Though the ghosts still do need to move under physics engine up to the sync frame mount. But since the sync frame is so stable, we can now greatly increase the sync frames distance apart, reducing the memory footprint of the game. After playing around with the ghosts for a little bit, I decided to change from an absolute velocity changing system to an acceleration based system. This means that I set a max speed and acceleration for my character. So when you press left, you instead change the character's speed by a small amount each frame, as opposed to simply setting it to their maximum speed. Then at the end of the system, we clamp the player's movement speed to their max move speed. This is done so that the game has a nicer feel to it and doesn't feel as sharp and jarring and makes it easier to sort of jump around corners, since if you jump out and then hold left, you sort of curve around instead of immediately shifting around and going around the corner, allowing for more coherent and nicer feeling motion. The next step was to create a way to create the ghosts and interact with them that was more user-friendly for the programmer. I did this using ghost events. At the release of this video, there are currently three ghost events that you can do. Clear the trail, clear the ghost, and spawn a new ghost. I then add a system that handles all these events and applies the appropriate modifications to the resources and include those into my application. Clearing the trail is simply setting the frame back to one and clearing the inputs and offsets resources so that they are reset and the player doesn't have the ghost following old trails. The reason we set the frame to one here and not zero like we originally initialized it with is because we increment the frame count at the beginning of every frame. This means that at no point will you actually ever be able to interact with frame zero, since this frame is incremented to one immediately after the first system run. If you don't set this to one, it can result in the jitter being really bad, since the offset frame will end up being one frame out of sync to the input frame. There are probably other ways to fix this and allow frame to be set back to zero, but the way that I came up with was just simply setting the frame back to one when we create it or reset it. Clearing ghosts simply iterates through all the ghosts in the world and despawns them. And spawning a ghost just does the same logic 
as spawning the player, but with the ghost component attached. Although currently, clear trail and clear ghost will almost always be called together, that is only because the game does not currently have any functionality where you might want to remove the ghosts but keep the trail that they follow. My envisioning for this is that there may be a power-up or collectible that you can do that will reset all the ghosts off the screen, allowing you to get a higher score without needing to worry about dodging as many ghosts. This would mean that you need to clear the ghosts without clearing the trail. The final thing to do in this video is introduce a score system so that the game actually has a goal or achievement to it. To do this, I use a resource that wraps around the score to keep track of the player's score. Then in the get collectible code, every time the player gets a collectible, we increment that score by one. We also have an equivalent system that will kill the player if they come in contact with the ghost. Currently the player is left in place when they touch the ghost. It simply clears all the ghosts away allowing the player to more or less set up where they want to start and then start collecting the game. Currently this does allow for an exploitation in that the player can stand still in the far off corner for a very long period of time, or simply at the start for a very long period of time, then collect the first collectible. From there, the ghost will simply stand still for a long period of time before starting to follow the trail. This could allow the player to collect lots of collectibles, depending on how long they want to stand still before starting collecting the collectibles. In the future, I intend to remedy this by making the first ghost spawn one or two seconds after the player hits a ghost, so that they have to be moving and they cannot stand still for more than that period of time before they will simply get reset again. Currently, the highest score that I've achieved in the game without using any kind of cheese tactics in order to get the ghosts to not follow for a long period of time is five which to me feels like a really low score, but shows the difficulty that this game presents. In the future, I intend to add larger maps and also provide multiple routes in order to get around so that the player has the ability to dodge the ghosts. I will also make the collectible not be able to spawn anywhere. As you can currently see, the collectible has spawned inside a platform. This is what the map data that I was referring to in the previous video will be used for, keeping track of where the collectible can spawn and potentially calculating the distance so that the collectibles can't spawn too close or too far away. In the next video, I intend to revisit the animation system, implementing some features that people have recommended, such as using a timer instead of an F32. When I revisit the animation system, I'll also do things such as adding jumping particle effects and other sort of quality of life aspects to the game. Feel free to leave any suggestions or things that you would like to see in this series in the comments, and I will hopefully do an episode covering those things later. I'm also planning to do a live stream of Programming Bevy. I put up a poll on my YouTube channel, and most people seem to either not care what I stream or would like to see me streaming the platformer series. So there will be a future live stream of me adding some features to the game. So please keep an eye out for that, and hopefully I will see you in the live stream. I'd like to thank everyone who made it to the end of the video and say please do check out my Patreon page if you are enjoying the content and would like to support or if you would like the scripts to my Bevy Basic videos I've decided to post them there for free for anyone to access so that you can get them if you want. If there is not currently a script up please just let me know and I will add them over time since I don't want to just go through and dump my entire backlog up in one day. But Hopefully you've enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and I will see you in the next one.